Hello, everyone. Welcome to the tech capital of the world, Kernersville, North Carolina. In here on another fantastic day, Kevin. Let's talk about some AI. Yeah, yeah. Let's get back to the AI. We figured. Here's, here's what we figured. We're about a year post like public release of this stuff, and it's probably yeah. We've talked about it across a lot of that time as well, but we haven't visited it in a while, so we thought like a year later, let's come back and talk about it again. Yeah as far as the d developers go anybody that listens to us on the podcast when we talk about it all the time on the podcast but not necessarily from the perspective as a, of a developer right so that's what we're gonna right about. and so like um full disclosure this has been out in the what ai came out in november last year so it's like a one year old it feels like it's the chat gtv has been out for 30 years now you know because like of all <laughs> the announcements and yeah but it's only been one year and when we had YouTube shows, we went back and looked at our shows that we talked about this. We were talking about the moment that thing came out, people were saying, this is the end of development. This is it. This is over. You're no longer going to get a dev job anymore because this thing can code a web page. Yep. And then when we started looking at it late last year, it could code a web page. Yes, yeah, sort of. Like sort of could code a web page, but not necessarily a website or web applications. And so now people are studying this. Can you take AI and actually do a pull request from a GitHub repo, fix the thing and push it back into GitHub and push it into production? And how successful are these models doing it? And so there's a study out that went and tried to do this. And they used what ChatGPT 4, 3, 3.5, and they used Claude yep. as well. Claude, yeah. They, so the main two that they talked about in the in the the article in the study were were Claude and ChatGPT. But they did test it with GPT four, but they did right. test it test it with GPT three point five, and they tested it with a couple of the Llama models from um, right. Meta too. So before you're out there and you're saying, yeah, Bobby, but did they use this one? This is my favorite model. I know this one's better. Um, we didn't do this study. I think it was what Cornell University or something like that. Something uh, like that. It was. Uh, oh, I forget. Now. I think it was Cornell. Yeah, yeah, it was Cornell. Yeah, Cornell. And so they they went. It's a pretty exhaustive search of this. Now, what they're building is a benchmark program. It's called SWE Benchmark, which is like um, if you feed it coding problems, can it solve them? Type scenario to put it in layman's term, and the, and and it tracks how well it does it. So much like we have benchmarks for CPU speed, benchmarks for graphic speed. Now they want to benchmark language models and then solve coding challenges. So they give them real world applications in GitHub and then they know the answer and then they compare the answer to what the, the large language model did or the AI. We'll just call it AI for now um, and find out, is it good at it? And so the results to me, um, well, weren't surprising to me, but that's surprising to a lot of people. Right. They included, by the way, the, the, the studying, they, they included uh, almost 2,300 uh, real words software engineering problems from GitHub. That was their like mm -hmm. test, um, their, uh, their, their test space here. And the results for Claude 2 were that it was able to solve, uh, I read into the study and this, this, this is like, the wording here isn't best, but Claude 2 basically managed 4.8% correct. Right. GPT-4 was 1.7%. And there is a caveat, right? You read into this a little bit more because yes, there's a caveat there's a as caveat. to how it even got those results. Right. And so what they did was they said, okay, I know there's a whole code base here, but we've looked at this answer and we know the answer is included in these files. So when you're looking at your solution, only look at these three files. They called this the Oracle method. The Oracle came in and told them where the answer was. And when it had the Oracle, it did 4.8%. 1.7%. When they did something else called BM25, which means include all of the context, um, these were like in the 0.7 range. 0.7, what, less than 1% of the time was it actually be able to do this. Now, here's what's interesting about this too, is these coding challenges are strictly backend, um, no UI, just logical pattern recognition, fix the software type problems, very straightforward type problems. Yeah. These are things you'd think it would do well at normally, right? This is right. Yeah. And so what, they, and, and it's a real world test. They were saying it had to get a PR. It had to diagnose from the PR with pull request, um, what the problem was and then go from there and try to figure out what code files do I change and 
and then I figure out what co-file to change and then I want to know does the change actually work and what it noticed is it could patch things pretty well in the 4.8%. <laughs> I would right, say like right. most of these were patches. When it had to create brand new files, it struggled mightily. Yep. Even more so than it does right now. So like, in other words, like, oh, you need a new page. This feature request required me to invent something new. It pretty much couldn't do those types of problems and solve those kind of issues. Um, and if there wasn't an Oracle there, it's pretty much wasn't successful at all. But I would say anything under 1%, is really like, you just can't do this at all. Imagine if you worked at a place and they gave you a hundred tickets, you know, for the year and your solve rate was like, you wouldn't I got one of them kind of close. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you wouldn't last a year, would you? You'd, <laughs> you're I mean, getting fired. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, if your success rate um, was like even 5%, let's say being generous, if it was 5%, right. you probably wouldn't have a job. Now, the other thing that was interesting about this study too, was they said the more context they gave it, the worse it did, which means that as the code base got bigger and we tried to include more and more into the code base, they said they use words like it would get distracted. So I guess, chat, I guess AI gets, has ADHD or something like that. It's looking over here, over there. It doesn't know where to even start to solve the solution. Well, that's the thing. I mean, which makes sense, yeah. right? When you give it more yeah. of a nebulous um, amount of of data it's hard for it to pinpoint like what exactly it needs to do in the context of those things because it hasn't necessarily been um been trained on on those things right um right and the context and just, was large yeah too large for it to to comprehend yeah the other thing is i noticed and i thought this was kind of funny because this goes into my like cost benefit analysis of ai in general is like they only could do some tests for chat tp4 because the costs were too high like you know like you know bro we got to yeah. This is anybody Cornell. That, I mean, anybody you know? that's used GPT-4 <laughs> will know it's expensive. Um, especially yeah, if from the AI. To, exactly. If you're Com doing, or not the AI, from the API standpoint, like you're right, hitting, you're right, right, API, it's, right. It's Comparing like, it to a 3.5, it's like, it's night and day difference. It's very expensive. That's why any of these tools where they give you access to GPT-4 is like in limited amounts. You get like two chats right. for free with GPT-4. That's because it's very expensive right. to run and use. Yeah, so... Um, so it doesn't do good at solving real world challenges. And I think this is the problem. So the, one of the, if you read into the study and if you don't want to read it, I'll just kind of give you the highlights. The first problem they faced was PR, was pulling the PR, which is like the PR is the user goes in and says, hey, there's an issue here and here's the issue. And they had a problem with PRs being well-defined with well laid out problems. And so they, they kind of cherry pick the PRs to make sure that the, the large language model could understand what the person was with the, when the PR was coming in, what, what should I do? And so for us to automate this in general, what I think what's going to happen is PRs can't be where they are today. So, and let's say PRs are ticket request systems or not all done through GitHub. So this is done completely through GitHub, which is like also, Another problem when you're saying I'm going to replace all my software developers with AI, AI is like, how do you manage just the request coming in? And is the request in a language or in a format that the computer can understand? So I've been plenty of meetings where you have meetings about things like that. And um, you're talking to the QA team or to the customer insurance team or whatever. And you'll get a, a request in your ticket says the blue button is broken on you know this page and you're like and you write back define broken when I click it it doesn't work what do you mean by that it doesn't work and so a lot of times what you have to do is even when it's reported from the person that's supposed to know how the system works they don't give you clear destruction clear instructions on how to reproduce the problem which is the number one reason why you can't fix stuff it's like it works on my machine is the problem <laughs> <Right>. that <laughs> right. yeah, like, yeah. because you don't know how to reproduce it or whatever. And so in all of these scenarios, this software benchmark is cherry picked to try to make the LM as successful as possible and create the scenario to which this could happen. And what I look at it is can AI replace a developer currently today? And what I've been saying since the inception of this, only people saying that are people that don't write software for a living. They don't work on large systems. 
the person working on a large system will go, hey, no way, bro. <laughs> but do you understand what I have to, I have to go talk to John down in QA and John's an idiot. And so John <laughs> can't tell me why this thing's broken. So I have to come back and go look at the system, trying to figure out what the heck he was talking about of like why the button doesn't work. I don't know why the button doesn't work. You're supposed to tell me. And then once I do that, then I have to figure out like in this massive spaghetti code code base that we have that was written by 20 other idiots. And that's the way, the way these software developers work. <laughs> yes, it is. You know, I'm the only smart one in this, in this whole organization. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, like, yep. so now I have to go figure it out and like what, what the change to make and what file to look in. And so I think when you start really diving into like, even at a junior level, what a junior dev does on a daily basis is infinitely more complex than what this software benchmark is doing. Now notice, here's the other caveat, and then I'll let you make any, ask me any questions or comment, is like, this only included script files on the back end. So we, this should be for LLM, the easiest problem to solve. The moment we introduce CSS, JavaScript, HTML, you know, back end code and API and yeah. all of these other kind of inner exactly systems. complexity of the interconnectability of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget about it, you know, and then not to mention things like the data's wrong. So let's say the application functions perfectly, but the data itself is wrong. And we've seen this a lot where you have to fix the underlying data, the way we stored it incorrectly. One of the examples was in a former life, I looked at credit card statements to try to undercover fraud and we built vast majority of these systems to suck in these credit card statements so that we could put them in a transactional database so we could like sort and filter them and look at them. One of the things you would, you'd have to do, and I'm sure there's some coders watching, you know, imagine pulling in just a, a full text document that could be formatted six ways to Sunday. How do you figure that out? And things like special characters, like quotes, single quotes, and trying to pull in the text, you'd run into all these problems and you have to like sanitize the data to get it in. Well, some systems, the front end doesn't sanitize the data coming in. So you end up having data problems on the back end and the bug is less, a, less apparent when the system doesn't work. It's like, why isn't that work? Like, why is the company name truncated by three characters? Like it should have been, there's 30 characters. Now looking at the data and it's like, oh, there's a single quote in there. Oh, okay. So that's the problem. It's truncating it when it pulls it back. So you got to fix the data or you fix another system. So even those complexity of problems aren't really, really able to be solved at this point. So I think our jobs are safe, Kevin. Right. So, so here's, so here's the thing. Let's talk about like, yeah. we've talked about right now, right? This is what we're talking yeah. about. Like yeah. right now, um, these, these LLMs are a tool. They're great. You use something like GitHub Copilot, right? You like yeah. some implementations of this stuff, right? Yep. It's like, it is an aid to you. And right now that's what it is. It's not, it's definitely not right now replacing developers, but you know, as, um, as, uh, plumbing here says, which based on this comment, I think you might want to stick to plumbing. I know you made that joke already, <laughs> but you may want to stick to plumbing. Let's talk about because every single time, every yes, time sir. we have ever talked about this, this, this comes up every single time just give it a few years or some equivalent of this yeah but what right. about gpt5 bobby what do you think five what about five well i don't know if five is going to come out they may make five they may make six they may leapfrog to seven i i really don't know doesn't what matter gonna it's, do it's going to advance right at some point it's gonna advance let's just say that somehow some way um what i would say is when you're looking at choosing a career you need to base your career choice based on what's going on right now and today you really can't look forward and say, well, I would have been a coder, but 10 years from now, the robots are going to replace my job and therefore I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to do what? What else are you going to do? And so you have to make choices on, on how it is today. What I would say is you can look at history to see if this is going to repeat itself, whether similar advancements that came along, did it displace a lot of workers? And when we talked about this morning in our, in our, early when we pre-produced this is like, remember spreadsheets when the spreadsheet first came out, it was like really going to be the end of accountants. Like no longer do I need the, the mysterious accountant to keep up with these large paper ledger books. And he's writing it down like Bob Cratchit, you know, like you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the Christmas Carol, yeah. Yeah. you know? And so that would be the end of accountants. And so what I would say with the advancement of a spreadsheet, did it increase or decrease that industry? 
and increase the industry because like now suddenly not only can the CPA work on this, but every other office worker on the planet can do this. And then spreadsheets became used for more things and different exactly. things. The, the use like, cases increased. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's that's exactly it. Yeah. And it didn't decrease accountants in any way, shape or form. It's that it increased um, the people that are, are managing finance. The thing that I find interesting is AI is a revolutionary product and it's really cool. And it's going to, what I would say is increase software development, but even without it, software development is increasing anyway, exponentially. So like when you look at the amount of systems that we're building is exponential, but then you add in, you know what? I could build systems on top of AI. I could use AI to build other systems. That's a whole new area of things that we're going to AI augment a lot of other pieces of software. Guess what you're going to need to do that? You're going to need coders to be able to come in and build those types of systems. And so I think that it's going to increase software development because we're, we're bringing in a new market segment on top of already the other market segment. The thing is it will make uh, software developers, I think more productive maybe. I think there'll be some things that will be relegated out of our industry where we don't have to do it. I think largely deployments can be automated, but I think even more that could even be m put more into a black box or we could, we just publish stuff and it gets coded out or it gets pushed out automatically. It kind of does that today already, but we still have DevOps engineers and we have those things monitoring these processes. Here's the thing that I do think without a shadow of a doubt, and I'm gonna predict the future a little bit. I told you I wouldn't, but I am. <laughs> Even if we make a black box that generates all code and no one becomes a coder per se in the next decade, the same number of people will have to monitor that black box to make sure that that it's outputting what it needs to do. We need to validate these systems. And a lot of people say, well, we're gonna get the AI robot to code it, and then also validate it on the back end. And I've always thought that was weird. I'm like, so why does the robot have to validate itself? Since the robot wrote it, why don't it just write it right the first time? Because it seemingly <laughs> shouldn't make mistakes to begin with, but we need a validator to validate the robot. And so we have this circular logic of like how this thing will work. Ultimately too, I think whether you can think robots will never gather requirements and be able to understand what the human needs and wants. And I've always said that, that this thing doesn't need or want anything. And a lot of people put software in this box of like, it doesn't do anything that impacts humans. Therefore the robot can decide what to do. But like every website we have is built to service humanity in some way, you know, whether that be an insurance claim or um, buying a house or, you know, tracking inventory or whatever it is, or your social media, those have outputs that humans want to see and consume. And so therefore that there has to be a human in this process that says, yeah, that, that, that looks great. You know, um, now if you take Twitter, for example, they say, Hey, let's remove headlines. And we're like, well, that's a great idea there, Elon. I mean, like, you know, maybe we should. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm saying so the, the AI could come out and say headlines are a waste of space. I can reduce the message cost by 26 kilobytes, yeah. and 26 kilobytes times all the messages will reduce the hosting bill by a hundred million dollars. Do it, done. And then someone says, well, this just uses, I don't want to use this anymore. And so like, there has to be some validation that comes in. I do think that humans will be involved in the process of gathering requirements forever. Um, validating the output oh, forever. forever. That's a strong word. Well, here's I mean, the thing. otherwise the you don't know say. if it's good works or not. Well, because you here's the thing no that idea. I would say, here's the counter argument yeah. to part of that. Because when you yeah. put the word forever in there, I don't think that's a forever thing. I think it's the near future thing, but we're thinking about the internet being made for humans. What if the internet isn't made for humans? What if the internet's made for the robots? The robots make the internet for the robots and there's some other output that it generates that is the human-based part. Um, right. But we're not talking about something that's now or you can even plan to be part of because it's, right. we're talking decades, if not centuries down the line in advancement of this stuff. This is not going to well, happen ultimately overnight. Humans want to consume information somehow, some way, whether it's HTML page or it's in your goggle or it's implanted in your brain through wave, wave frames. You know, I don't know. Like either way, we're going to consume information somehow. And the robots can't automate certain things that we just take for advantage. You know, I, I like, for example, you've watched the Apple show, the silo, you know, where they had the silo and then and the silo is at the bottom of it. And there's a machine that keeps the silo running. Like eight people knew how that worked. 
and only one person could really fix it <laughs> right. because it was lost technology. Um, but you still need people to come in and kind of like make sure that this thing's doing what it's supposed to do. And I think that's where I think that you always have people saying, what do you want the machine to do? I'll tell it for you. That's what the programmer does today. And today, if you look at a language, a programming language is really the interface between the human language you have, which is English or Spanish or whatever. We translate those thoughts from the product stakeholder into a language that the computers goes, oh, I know what you're saying. Let me convert that over into this other code so I can execute that. That's called a compiler. And I think that process, however we do it, will kind of exist because the humans are the ones that need the machine to do something. And so they need right. to tell the machine somehow to do this. Now, the language that that the, com the computer can understand that can change. It's been changing for a long time. You know, whether that's, you think JavaScript's gonna be here for 50 years. I mean, we'll see in 50 years, but um, now they're talking about creating language specific, coding languages specific for LLMs. You know, instead of LLMs trying to understand C Sharp or understand JavaScript or understand right. that, they wanna take Mojo or something like that where there's this unreadable humans can't read it, but the LLMs understand it. I don't know if that's gonna be a thing, it's potentially a thing. But if we're creating black boxes, black boxes still need to be understood by somebody or the black box will break and no one know how to fix it. Hence in the world of silo, I guess that's that's true. You know, eventually, you know, no one right. understood how the silo worked. Right. Um, let's uh, look at this real quick too, because you're in, you're in kind of good company when we're talking about this. So let's say we are talking about the future, right? And we're like, yeah. Um, kind of predicting where we're going to go with this stuff. And uh, this was a recent story from the GitHub CEO. Um, basically, um, oh, we got Super Chat, cool. Uh, Luke, thank you. <laughs> says, how many years of pro.net experience do I need before I can work for Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> depends on the job, depends on what we're doing, man. So like, uh, you know, when we're hiring, I just hired someone yesterday, last week. I didn't hire them, I placed them in a place and they had like eight years of experience. There you go. <laughs> so eight years, is that the answer? I don't, I don't For know. that job. For that every one. job's different though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but um, thank you for the super chat, Luke. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Luke. So yeah, this is basically saying that uh, here's one of the things that we, we, we kind of have touched on a little bit before in the past, yes. but the, the amount of software is only going to grow um, and the amount of work that needs to be done on legacy systems is also only going to grow. That can kind of only be done by humans at this point for sure so yeah the, the ceo of github believes that it's still going to grow um a couple so of other places. the ceo the ceo get this is why i trust people like this because these people have worked in places before and so they're not just social media influencers or i'm thinking about the thing about software development i'm a i'm a futurist and i don't like those people that make these predictions because they're not they don't understand the complexity he said if you walk in any bank today you're going to find out that they have COBOL code running from the 60s and all the COBOL go guys have retired or died. I mean, like, you know, so um, and I know that I've worked in banks before and I can remember talking to the COBOL guys and it's like it's literally like you you think you're on the, the Jedi Council out there. You know, it's like <laughs> these guys are 900 years old yeah. and, you know, yeah. they speak to you in terms like Yoda and you're like you're trying to figure it out as a young Padawan, like. Does this thing work? Or like, the crazy thing is they're making a fortune, aren't they? Because there's they're only eight a of fortune. them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, so those are the type. Of, and that doesn't even get to And he mentioned it, like the code that was built in the 70s, yep. the 80s, 90s. the 90s, the 2000s, and now we're yep. in, you know, the 2020s. So, like, all of these legacy systems are built up over time. And there's just... Um, we're not gonna train, I'm not gonna say there's no way, we're not gonna put the time and effort to train all the systems on every known iteration of software development. Yeah, agreed. Only gonna be feasible to really point the computer at certain problems that it can do really well. And I think that what you're seeing is like in this, in genome research, for example, can I train it to do something really, really well to do trillions of calculations that a human would take them a while to do it? Great. Can I make the NFL schedule for 32 teams to make sure they don't overlap, you know, in all these cities? Well, you know, now they say ADOS does that in like, you know, I think they print the schedule out on demand pretty much. 
Right. Whereas before, it just it took a months of like right. planning to make sure that okay, we got to cross travel. We got to make sure they play this many games in the division, this many games out of the division. And there's all these complex problems, and now it can just spit it out because it knew it solved that problem, that one particular problem, very well. And because it can do that, I think people make the leap. Well, if it can do that, surely it can build a simple website. And you're like, well, it's a different problem. You know, it's a totally different problem. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and then it has different inputs and different outputs and different expectations. And like, it's actually more nebulous than a schedule for the NFL. I mean, it's way more nebulous to build just websites. So when you prompt build me a website for my taco restaurant, which we've done before, it can build a website in. Well, it can build kind of partial I mean, web like, page, know, maybe. Do I like it? Do <laughs> I have to change it? Yeah, because the inputs that I put in there and then the output, the expectation from the customers is really different than what a language model can do today. And that's why I think that what he's saying is there's exponential growth for software development because every day someone's going to wake up and their company are like, okay, I need a system that does this. Yep. And that's not something I can buy. Therefore, I need someone to build it. Um, I put it, I put another thing we talked about too, is like, imagine um, we could look at image generation. Um, we can look at web builders like Squarespace, Wix, and all these kind of things. And um, the way this was couched to us last year was like the, the greedy CEO is going to fire all of us developers and just prompt his way to success in building these things. And that's the way they were saying it. And like, well, no, that's not going to happen. The greedy CEO doesn't understand the problem well enough, but even if he did, he's not going to do it. Case in point, the greedy CEO needs a website today. He absolutely 100% can drop onto Wix, Squarespace, whatever, and build a website. Sure. Does he? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He has somebody yeah. to do it. I've I've right. literally built websites on Squarespace for people. For, right. For, for, not for people, for companies. Right. Like that have come to me and been like, hey, I need a, I'm, sure, I can do that. Right. And that's a web builder. And you can say it's a technology that generates websites. It's not AI to some degree. But even then, the knowledge worker that you say is going to replace all of your work doesn't do it. And the, there's a really good reason why, because even today, if I took the greedy CEO and says, you must build the website, you can't hire anybody. You can't ask for help. You must build it. And if they, if you pointed into a square space right now, they couldn't do it. They could make a website, <laughs> right? but it would be badly worded or badly designed or all the images are wrong and the colors are wrong. And it's like, and it just throw wouldn't hands work. Off. Let's say it had yeah. more, let's say it even had some functionality, even a simple form or something yeah. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. They would, yeah. you, they'd they mess that up because let's say that they want it to go to a, I don't know, to like MailChimp or something. It's like, while it's kind it. of like, it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's like, it's not over complex, but a lot of people wouldn't figure that out. No, it's kind of technical. It's technical enough. <laughs> right. Right. And then the other thing too is like, let's imagine too, you want to say, okay, let's just forget. Let's say we can point it to Google Docs. You know, they probably get the Google Docs account wrong and then they wouldn't know where all their forms are going. But like the other thing is, let's say that we need to point it to MailChimp and then we need to use something like if then this, that or Zapier. Forget about it. Oh, yeah. Forget, it, it, forget about it. It's oh, yeah. not happening. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of people in my industry. And I've worked in companies and I've worked with, you know, marketing managers, CTOs, dev managers. And then when you, when you have to really kind of bring it in and say, this is what we're trying to do. Here's the problems that we're facing. And it's really hard to explain to them, like in technical terms, like how things kind of work. Yep. And so just imagine, and that's why I don't think, I know I wasn't supposed to, this is why I don't think it'll <laughs> ever replace software development as a job. So I don't think the job will never cease to exist. What you do may change. We may not write some, I totally agree with that. some types of code at, at one point, but the guy, the person that's doing the job will always do this job, but your functions may change. I think today, the person that was a blacksmith today may be a car mechanic now in the future. You know, I've heard it expressed like this. You could talk to a bunch of users and they say, I need a faster horse. I need to ride this horse. Can we bioengineer a faster horse? And the computer would say, yeah, let's go work on that problem. Let's try to bioengineer a faster horse. 
And then someone who comes around like, well, what about a car? Why don't I just make you a machine that does what that horse does? And then that's where horsepower comes from. This one has 50 horses in it, you know, or 150 or 350 horses right. in it. And so the invention, the human came up with, oh yeah, horses aren't fast enough and I can't change the horse. Let me give you something else, a carriage, a motorized carriage that you can use and drive around. And people at the time, but that was the, like, if you could go back and look at the newspaper articles written about the car, like it'll never replace the horse ever, ever, ever. Um, and people thinking that, well, that's what AI is going to do. Well, it is. But what I'm saying is the jobs will change. But I, I think software engineering is here for the next decade to 20 to 30 years easy because well, of the complexity too, involved. Sure. That's just the sheer complexity involved in building a website today is like, off the charts compared to 1995. You know, so 1995, you would make index.html, you'd write some inline styles, maybe an external JavaScript, maybe in 95, maybe not, maybe it was- mm, Maybe it was later, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but like, you know, but today you gotta have, you gotta care for your package manager, you know, your builder, you gotta run some scripts just to build, you know, your Hello World app. It's, it's kind of crazy what you have to do now. So the complexity is increasing. The other thing too, that changes a lot is the way we do things. And the guy from GitHub talked about this from the 60s, he was using COBOL in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And you go all the way up to 2024 and like the frameworks are changing. And even when a framework comes out, the next framework is right after that. So like it changes quite a bit and therefore you're gonna have to train the models on all of these new techniques going forward. And I just think it being really hard to do. It's a tougher problem to solve than people think. Yep, definitely. Uh, let's look at some other things that that, that yeah. kind of kind of push this as well and kind of agree with this we'll look at um like we've used this before but bureau of labor statistics a couple of things on here when you look at like software developers they group in software developers with quality assurance testers analysts sorry and testers at the same time but yeah. this is again has a 25 percent increase for the next what's that from 2022 to 2032 so again it's predicting predicting uh, uh, an, uh, uh an incline in the number of um uh new developers that are needed here they specifically have a web developer section too again they talk about it being 16 percent uh, much faster than average again this is bureau of labor statistics stuff we're talking about here so if ai was going to take over this is like this is current today a year after like this is still predicting this increase in um <coughs> uh in developers and then the, the the last one to talk about here which i which i like this 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 is a great website will robots take my job um <laughs> so, which i thought is great this is this has come up in the last year because of ai right um, yeah. So we're talking about web developers here, and there's a couple of things here. So it's got it's a 39% risk level, which they which is in their low section. It's just in their low right. section, right? They're saying that it it's uh, they have a, a limited risk of automations that demands a mix of technical and human centric skills, which is exactly your point. It takes yeah. the human and the AI to kind of work together. It can't work on its own. Right. Um, but the the part that I found interesting was the, the discrepancy between the way that they rate this based on their their stats versus what the people think. So the people can, can come here and vote and you can say in the next, I think it's in the next decade, I think the question is like, do you believe that AI will take this particular role? And 53% of people, more than half, believe that that was true. Yep. So, But I bet you the people that are voting aren't web developers. True. I, I agree with that because it doesn't- That's what I think. Yeah, it doesn't make you answer that. I agree. And also yep. we're talking about like, why? Why do they, why, why is that the case? Why do they think that? I think there's a lot of people out on social media that do this for clicks and engagement and they want to, it's easier to sell fear and FOMO than it is to do what we do, which is tell you how to do something. And for whatever reason in our psyche, we want to be scared before we'll listen to someone versus someone that says, Hey, you know what? This is how you do right. it. You know, this is what's going to happen. I mean, that's and so. It's marketing 101, isn't it? It's like yep. play on people's fears. It's like that's if you can get somebody to be scared of something, you can kind of sell them or convince them of something. <laughs> right. It's just that's just how it is. Right. And so, like, you know, like, I mean, you know, Bitcoin comes out, it's the end of currency. Well, we have like 50 types of like Bitcoin type currencies plus the dollar set around, the yen, the ruble, and all these things. And no one really looked at like, well, for us to go to a one world currency, what would have to happen? Well, we have to figure out all the exchange rates between all of these different countries. And it's just like, when you start like thinking about it, you're like, that's not happening. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, is Brazil gonna say, okay, I'm buying into this percentage, you know, today. And so 
it's really difficult for those things to take over. While we could see some efficiencies in that system, there's humans involved. And so it's just really hard for us to, to course correct some of these systems. And it's the same way in software engineering. You're like, you mean I got to give up React? Where well, a large language model doesn't do React. So like, <laughs> yes, you can't build it with React, you know? And you're probably thinking, well, in the future, no one will care. They will care. They care like what it produces and what it happens. And so it's just a, uh, it's a really complex problem. It's way more complex than people give it credit for. And the only people doing this want engagement on their channel for whatever reason that that's what they're doing as a content creator. It's easy to sell things. I could start a channel. Yeah, this this yeah. this is a great take. Yes, I agree this, with that. This is this is a great take, Legado. You a hundred percent. Yeah, it is. It one hundred percent is. And we've it's, talked and to it's, people that and it's firmly bad. believe this. And it's bad because it is because we've shown you like the the stats here. It's like it's increasing. Don't, don't believe somebody that tells you that this is like going down the pan they have ulterior motives i, I don't whatever they are they, ha they have ulterior motives it is 100 yeah. percent keeping people out i saw a uh, a reddit post on um I don't know if it was on the, the boot camp reddit or on like coding um this is the programmers reddit or whatever it was but somebody was asking um this was the, the last couple of days um you can probably find it on there but it was um asking which area of um development should i go into particularly the first comment was none. They're all saturated. AI is right. basically taking everything. And it's like, and then it had tons of upvotes. And I was like, who, what? I was like, is this reality? Is this, do you, what, what, what makes you think that? Because that's just not what's actually happening. Yeah, because I think in general, the loudest people in the space of coding are the people, and I, if you're one of these, I'm sorry that aren't successful <laughs> at it. So like they're telling you that I can't get a job, therefore no one can. And what they don't understand is how people are getting employed in this industry. I can tell you this, as complexity has increased, the requirements for an entry level dev, dev job has increased as well. And so like a lot of times college is included in this. This is why boot camps exist, is that colleges are rooted in early web development for as what they they teach. And now I think as they got more competition from boot camps, they came around. But like, you know, so, and you have still people out there saying, all you need to know is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you can get a 100K job next week. And then will we see people apply for roles? And so this is what we were talking to Tech Systems this morning. And Tech Systems is one of the partners here at Coder Foundry. And they were talking about the challenges of finding people for these roles. Yeah. And they'll say that, yes, I'll get a thousand applicants to a role or 200 hence, applicants. Hence, to hence the illusion of saturation. Yes, the illusion of saturation. He says, but when I look at them, nine out of 10 of them have nothing to show that they can do the job. And so I can't even like evaluate them as a potential candidate. So I have to pass, 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 pass. And then I get down and I find out, okay, these people have portfolios, they have work, we can prove them. The other thing that's going on is people are trying to automate their job search. <laughs> yeah, you know, we had some amazing bots, feedback you know? on this, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> and so while a lot of times saying I can't tell the difference between AI generated stuff and and human generated stuff, let me tell you, HR people can. They can see it a mile away. They're like, they're, oh, they're telling us they can. Yeah, they're saying that's that's AI generated, and they want to talk to a human with real world experience. And so what we've been saying for the last fifteen years is, if you don't have a portfolio, you're going to get a lot of soft nose tons and tons of soft nose. It's not AI taking your job. The requirements are up here and you're still down here trying to say, I just know HTML. That's all I need to know, right? That's what you need to know to build a web page today, right? No, you need to know a lot more to build a web page today than you did 15 years ago. Yep. And so you have to adjust with the time. The second thing I see people is when they're posting these things on Reddit is older people and I'd say older is relative to based on maybe they've been in the industry for a while and they haven't kept up with the times. They don't want to keep learning. They want a new learn thing. So they have self relegated out of the industry because they haven't kept up. Um, so they want to stay doing what they know how to do and they don't want to keep learning. And they think, well, AI is going to take my job. Well, before five or six or seven years ago, before this chat TV thing came out, those same posts, we're talking about people that are 19 years old, straight out of high school, taking my job. Or in the US, my job's gonna be taken by a bunch of people from overseas because 
you know, and it was the same guy making the same post. And the reason is his skills are out of date. Yeah, he's just got and a new target now. He's got a new target and that's all he's doing. And so like, we're, sh we're moving the cheese as far as like what the enemy of this is. I can tell you this, what I firmly believe over the next decade, if you invest in yourself, you invest in skills, you're going to be employed in this market because there's not enough people right now to do it. Yep. We um, had less than one percent. Yeah, go. I was gonna go ahead. We we had the um we, we had the recruiter telling us that they had so many like, I think they literally called them like the Chat GPT applications. I think is what they called them. But like yep. they had they had so many AI applications that they just wanted to like shut it off. They came to us to be like, do you have some real humans we can actually employ? That's yeah. literally what they can. That's, 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 that's what they asked us. Like, you know what? We, we do. We have some students from Code Foundry. Here yeah. you go. Please take a look at them. We will vouch for these as being actual people who we yeah. know can code. Now, I know this is going to generate some comments. The other thing they said that was kind of funny. It's like they were saying, like, we talked to CS grads. We talked to all these people all the time. I, <laughs> I kid you not, Kevin. And I was like, yes. And they said they don't have .NET on their resume. Like they've never heard of it. Like they don't know what C Sharp is and they've never built anything with .NET. And what we need is .NET people. And I know I'm like, yes. And, and I still like, to this those? day, I get these comments on YouTube that says, you don't know what you're talking about. Mern is where it's at. I'm like- I saw that one, yeah. Mern? <laughs> <laughs> like I get Mern? it, you've invested in it. I get it, you've learned your thing. Like you wanna kind of like, you want to, I don't know, you want to defend it somehow. You want to, I don't know, you're right. offended when somebody says something else is, is a thing, even if it is, but right. it doesn't make it a thing. <laughs> so what I would say is, and I've said this for 15 years too, is like, I'm going to do what makes me money. And so like this job skills I have is a way to generate income. And that means whatever I have to do, whatever I have to learn, whatever I have to teach is what's in demand because that's what people want. And so... Right. This wasn't .NET. I would teach Java. Right. I can learn Java. I don't have any like. <laughs> it's not religion to me. Like it's just like this is a way to make money. And so like I think that when you approach it that way, you end up saying I got to be a lifelong learner. I've got to constantly advance my skills, and I won't be edged out by AI. Do I think AI could encroach on some edge cases around what we're doing? Yeah, possibly. Um, I think it's going to make my life easier because I don't have to do those certain types of things anymore. But like just core coding and like taking the project from point A to point B from like blank page to that. We are like, I mean, we, we're long we're, ways. From yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are a long, long time away from, you know, from giving an AI the idea of an, well, let's just say. Let's just say it's even the idea of an application, right? A prompt yeah. that is an idea for an application, which you could say. You could take it even more abstract than that than just say AI solve a problem, but you could, yeah. you, could you could even abstract this even further, but you yeah. could just say, AI, give me this application to specifically do this. Here's your, here's your system requirements. And it definitely can't do that. It definitely no. can't get to the point of writing uh, complex things that, that are, that interact with each other that ultimately get deployed to a server that a user can click on. I mean, we are way, 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 way away from that. Right. There's a lot of invention that has to take place for that to happen. You know, like, and, yep. and a lot of people think that, and I talk to people all the time and they tell me that I'm like a dinosaur and just don't know I'm dead yet. I'm like, you just <laughs> don't, but you don't work in the industry. You have no idea. It's like, it's saying the AI is going to replace mechanics at this point. Like, no, it can't turn a wrench. I mean, like, it's just not going to do that. Yeah, um, we, we won't need wrenches. We'll have those robots that come by. We and still have push. robots that can manufacture cars, but we still don't. We still have humans putting cars together. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Is it because yeah. totally of the of the labor unions? No. If Ford could get rid of every single person and just replace them with robots, they absolutely would. I agree. You know, they unions would. Unions are not unions. They would. So they absolutely 100 you know, you know this is amazon's goal right this is 100 this is amazon's goal they just put happen. out a new they just put they just put out a new robot this week did you see this i don't know if you saw the story we no. might talk about this on not no next week but there was amazon introduced a robot in their warehouses that can kind of move around and do stuff but it's right. like you know that is their goal so when amazon does it that's when we know that it's that it's going to happen but right now we, i mean we're decades away from that like we Decade. really are you know and so the other thing is, I think what you're going to ask, the other thing too is the cost of this is like the j real cost oh, yeah. to running a large language model it's to do huge. all of your coding. The cost is astronomical. And so well, like the other thing is like- story with the cost of Copilot. It, what, what did it cost? It was like 80 bucks or something. It's costing- 80 bucks them. a month. You're spending 10. <laughs> 
Yes. And so that's, that's the cost deficit between how much Copilot costs Microsoft to run versus how much they're that's charging That's only going to go so long. And they know that the moment you make this $100 a month, usage goes way down. They're like, well, I liked AI, but I don't like it that much. I mean, like, you know, like, let's be right. real. I can type yeah. this in, yeah. um, you know, um, so yeah. I think that's really what, what you're going to see is so a lot of times we say, well, how much does it cost to replace my dev team? Even if it could. And it's like, okay, and I can't talk to anybody and all these other kind of costs that associated with that fixes. And like, does it work all the time? Is it available all the time? Like, is it available 24 seven, you know, those, and you're saying, well, humans aren't I'm like, well, you can, if you have that need, you can get offshore yeah, you teams, can you can get for onshore sure. teams, yeah. you can arrange for it, you can pay for it. Um, you know, people to this day are still on call, you know, like things break, you walk into the office on a Saturday because it's broken. Um, so you can arrange for all of that. And then I think there'll be a cost benefit when someone says it's a hundred million dollars to run all your stuff up here on Azure. You know, if you're a big company and you're like, how much do developers cost? It, it ultimately will get there. It's right. Yeah. Because you could say like, it is this massive cost difference now. So you, and you but you could say like, oh, well, of course, the, the counter argument to this is, well, it's going to come down. The cost is going to come down, right? Yeah. Um, I don't buy that for a second. The cost isn't going to come down. The cost mm -hmm. is only ever going to go up. They are never going to say, well, you know, the NVIDIA chip now is like, I can get that $10,000 uh, GPU, CPU now, the, the GPU yep. that runs the, the AI. That was $10,000 this year. Now it's only $5,000. So you know what? I'm going to charge my customer less. No, no, no. They're going to buy more and they're going to buy generation two of that chip, which also costs $10,000. The price right. only ever goes up. It's never coming and down. The best scenario to see is like, you know, is, is PC hardware cheaper today? than it was a long time ago. And I, I bought my Mac Studio when it came out, the Mac One Studio, yep. was almost four grand for that yep. little box. Yep. It's $4,000. And so like $4,000, would I have spent $4,000, you know, 20 years ago on a PC? Probably not. Right. <laughs> this right. one's way better and more expensive, but like, you know, my 486 machine that I have, or 386 machine that yep. I bought, you know, I would college. say if anything, it's the same or more. Like yes, yeah, the same because, or more. Because but what like, happens is it's like you're not buying apples to apples. You're not buying a 1995 PC today, are you? Let's right. say that you did spend four thousand dollars on, on a PC in 1995, right? You buy 1995 technology. The difference is you're spending four thousand dollars today on a PC for 2023 technology. The technology keeps advancing. The cost stays the same or goes up. It's that's just how it. Right. That's just how it is. Right. And I think the same thing will be true for software development. This this AI replacing AI for coding when you do it at large scale becomes really expensive to do. I think it's going to be targeted towards specific problems that it can train exceedingly well to do a specific thing. And I think those types of things it'll do really well at. But just this general like code me up something. I don't know really what I want. I'll know it when I see it type problem. I don't so, know if it's even so, useful so, training so, it. So Luke disagrees with me here. Of course, the cost will come down. I hope you understand my logic here, Luke, that the cost doesn't come down. The technology advances and the cost goes up or stays the same. That's just proven across time. The cost for, the cost for, a, the, for let's, let's take an iPhone. The cost for an iPhone, yes, for the first generation, like if you're buying it, then it costs, let's say it was $500. Today, that might cost $100. But trust me, the iPhone 15 is now $1,500. It is. It's only gone up because the technology has advanced. It's going to be the same. They're going to keep pushing the technology and keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing that and saying it's doing more and more and more, and it will only go up. We're not buying, it's not apples to apples. This is apples and oranges. Yeah, because technology changes, um, you know, the transistors count changes, the manufacturing process yep. changes, which they have to recoup those costs, which means that an NVIDIA A1000 or an NVIDIA 2000, whenever that comes out, yep. it's going to be $10,000 or $16,000 or $20,000 where it's today is $10,000 per chip. Which, and then be which, because we're running increased workloads to do this, Microsoft and OpenAI and Azure and AWS and all this guys like, I need the fastest hardware because I got too much demand coming in for this stuff. I can't run them quick enough. So I have to, I have to build more new data centers again, which in turn, comes back and say, well, you know, you want to run those BioGM project you're doing? Okay, that's that's more money this year. <laughs> it's because I'm I'm increasing my bandwidth of what we can do.
And I think right. that's where the cost benefit analysis, you've got to consider that when they say, well, it's just easier to do it with programmers and I get a better result. I, I think I, that's where it's going to be for the next easy 10 years. Yeah. So think about your life. If you're 30 years old and you're saying, I'm going to get a 20 year career out of this, it's still a good trade off, man. I mean, like, you know, you're going to be 50. Yeah. So maybe you won't be slinging code like I am in their mid 50s, but you know. Plus, I think it just like AI is just another evolution of of the life, just another tool in the life of a developer, yeah. right? Like yeah. you could say back in, let's say, let's take, I don't know, 99, right? You were making websites in 99, right? Yeah. None of the, none of that skill that you were using back then or very little of it is, it, it, you know, the fundamentals are the same, I guess. It's still HTML and CSS and JavaScript, right? right? But, but you use mm -hmm. it in a very, very different way now. Um, but you're also still just, you're still called a web developer. So your skills have changed. If you were a web developer back in 99, you can be a web developer today, but you're doing a very, very different job. And yeah, I predict the same set. thing will be the same in 10 years time, 20 years. Did you time. know that mobile was supposed to kill web anyway? And it never did. I mean, like it just made a new thing, <laughs> you know, like now we build websites for mobile and web. Yeah. And that's what I think AI will have a similar thing where like you're either integrating AI or you're putting AI into your apps and you know more about it. It's going to make another segment that we that we write code for, we're always going to be writing code for the foreseeable future. Right. So is anyone yelling at me yet? I haven't looked at the, wow, oh, there's a lot of chat up here. <laughs> so, uh, <all> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. Oh, I did have one thing from earlier. Hold on. What did I say? Um, <laughs> I, 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 I liked, um, here. I, I like Luke's, Luke's comment here really. He said, will I attend endless pointless meetings? It has to, right? <laughs> How's it going to get requirements, man? <laughs> you know? I just thought that was a funny, I just thought that was a funny take. That's, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> uh, yeah, good stuff. Uh, let me see here. What are we saying here? Um, yeah, this 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 will be a thing too. I'm um, into, yeah, increasing costs in cloud infrastructure will also lead to price increases. Um, Here's what's crazy. I was thinking about this this morning, Simon. Like, it's funny that you bring this up. AWS and Azure is not the cheapest thing on the planet. Like, in other words, like you can now host something probably on your own hardware for a monthly cost cheaper than you can on the cloud. When the first the cloud came out, they'll say, hey, reduce cost, reduce complexity, reduce all these things. And what these guys have done is taking cloud and turned it into a platform that you have to code against. And so now you're coding against AWS and Azure, not because it's cheaper, because that's the new platform that it is. And Microsoft has done that. And so like now we'll spend a lot more on hosting to host a website because it's more expensive to host it, but we want to because of you know, horizontal scalability or like, you know, fault tolerance. There's a lot of enhancements that come with cloud that we really like. But is it absolutely cheaper? Can I stand a web box up and just hook it to the internet cheaper than I can um, an Azure instance? Yeah, for a lot of cases, yeah. And so it, the prices have increased there. I mean, for sure. It's one of those things, isn't it? It's kind of like get you kind of hooked on it and then jack up the prices. And I think right. that kind of has to happen with AI at, at this point because the disparity, even if, even if we stayed the same in terms of like the hardware stayed the same so the prices would come down, I don't think that um the on, on on the front end they would just be like well you're now dependent on it therefore we've kind of got to put the price up a little bit so you know you yeah. need that ai right now because it's part of it's integral to your business well it's going to cost you a little bit more now a little bit more um, i mean if you think you think we've talked about this on the not no podcast that microsoft is going to stand up like small nuclear reactors to pay for the power concerns for azure Right. You think that they're not going to charge that downstream to us? Like, you know, like <laughs> exactly. so AI and cloud computing is costing a lot of power. And then probably rightfully so if you have, I don't know where the data centers are. And I'd say are, which means there's probably multiple of them all over oh, the sure. country. Yeah. I yeah. imagine when they pluck one of those babies down, they're like, how much power do you need? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that's like we, you that's need to problem. figure something out. You need <laughs> yeah. a windmill or something, man, bro, because yeah. I don't know if there's enough power for us to, for you to yeah. suck that amount of power down. So they're yeah. looking at like powering these with small footprint nuclear reactors. It and seems insane, right? But that's, seems insane. But that's what they're doing. <laughs> that's what they're doing. That is so, what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, crazy stuff. Um. Let me look here. Let's, uh, um, 
Sam says AI will be booking the me the meetings in your calendar. Probably true. Hey, that well, is the do it already. I mean, like yeah. can, but this is like this. Is, I've always said this is like my ultimate thing, right? We want um we want we want Jarvis. You can just be our we do personal AI assistant. That's where that's where AI shines for me. That's where I want my AI. But even like, I would I would take everyone to say if you want to look at the pinnacle of AI in movies, go watch Iron Man one when he's building his first Iron Man armor. And the way he converses with that, those guys, the writers were really genius about how that worked because that in 2008, none of this really existed. You're right. It's but kind the of one thing I find done. absolutely hysterical was the robot would take the thing over and try to do something. He'd go, get out of the way. You're useless now. Get out of the way. Let me let it. <laughs> and Tony Stark's still like, you know, welding together the actual like circuit in the boot there. And I think that's where we're going to use it as a tool um, and not necessarily as the one that builds it. And now he had all of his stuff automated by the end of it, where he could just say, I'm going to the party, you know, put a little hot rod red in it, you know, <laughs> and, yep. you know, and so, but ultimately he designed and built everything. And he was the engineer at that point that had the idea for the armor and knew what he wanted. And he melded together AI and his own engineering skills together to make something. And that's at the pinnacle of what we could probably imagine in science fiction, you know, um, a lot of the lowbrow of science fiction is the AI is just our companion. You know, like if you look at Blade Runner, it's just a companion. It doesn't really do anything useful other than it's my girlfriend. You know, if you look at the second Blade Runner. Um, and so like, we want it to do more than that. I mean, we want it to like be Jarvis. That's what we'd like. We would love to have a personal assistant that could do things for us. But even that, when you think about that, you start trying to solve that problem and you really try to build Jarvis, there's a lot of work to be done there for that to happen. You know, a lot of invention. You know, we're not going to get to Ultron anytime soon, you know, where it's going to just oh. become aware and take over everything <laughs> and drop a city from, you know, the, the atmosphere and kill everyone on planet oh, Earth. I was looking forward to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was going to be fun. It'd make the news more interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else before we wrap up? Let's come to the top Any last here. questions for the road or anybody? Uh, I don't have a question from anybody now. Um, no, we'll just do this one last thing then. Wants to know, um, yeah, man wants to know, it'd be nice if we could see a live like this with a new Blazor app template. I just did something last Friday on that. Yeah. But I can do it again. Um, but yeah, go back and look. Um, we're going to be, somebody else asked me There's in, um, actually two new Blazor templates out there. There's a web app template and the new, um, standalone web assembly template out there that we're playing with. Um, I, I am recording a video that will talk about this in terms of forms authentication and like how not forms authentication but like forms validation and it'll showcase the template but not necessarily talking about the template expressly but going through the two template scenarios and how form validation works under those two scenarios so there are two templates that we need to be talking about and we are building a course for this it'll be out january ish yeah you can see a ish. bunch more blazer yeah yeah a bunch more blazer stuff coming uh, both here on YouTube and in our course. And we mentioned this before, but as of January, we're going to be our virtual uh, course. Which is our full time. We'll be all Blazer. We'll be all Blazer. So, and, and people think I'm crazy, YouTube. man, but if you've been paying attention, man, just type in Blazer in your YouTube channel and you can see this is hot, dude. Like it is coming down the pipe. And like uh, Microsoft's done a really good job building this out. And um, it's going to be a very um hot technology coming out in 2024 so yeah they I'm, seem to be very clear about this is going to be the way don't they? this is the way for them you know which is when you look at the market they're one of the big players and so other people will have other put their other voices in there but microsoft's going to have a really loud voice and saying this is how you build web apps this is how we're going to do it this is how you should be doing it and i think blazer.net 8 is going to be the way to do it it's pretty cool i'm excited about it Okay, let's wrap up. Let's go uh, get tacos. All right, let's get some tacos, baby. Um, the official Coda Frowny Orange Monster. There we go for the road. Hold on, what what, what flavor is that? Is it's it the new CF flavor, Ultra Sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. We got to deal with Monster now. Wasn't yeah, aware it. Of it. <laughs> I keep it low low profile, so like. <laughs> uh, I like it. Cool. Well, we'll be back again uh, next week another one of these maybe we'll do something blazer next week i don't know we'll see we'll see what the news brings us over the week and then we'll pick something and we'll be back again Hang keep coding guys, guys. see you next friday take care